So if anyone has just joined, so apologies, didn't catch that the recording had not started. So if anyone prefers not to be recorded, obviously, you know, you're more than welcome to. Well, you need to be on the class because you want to make sure you get the attendance and you get the credit. But still, if someone you know, has any problems with being recorded, I just want to make sure that um, I let you all know that from this point, we are recording it. So now we, this next slide talks about the evolution of project management. So think about PMI being founded back in 1969. Some of us may have been here in 1969, others may not. And so when you think about an organization that has been so ingrained in project management for so long, and then we go up to this point, and at this, this snapshot that they did here was 2022. And I know my chapter just celebrated, I think, their 50th anniversary um, last week. So it has been around for a, a very long time. And when this organization formed, it was really around the whole project management methodology, you know, with skills and the tools and techniques that we use, how do we do things where we can deliver this project successfully. And it has evolved over time. So when they first came out, most of the projects were based under the waterfall methodology. So basically everything was kind of, you know, running, running in a sequence versus today, many of us use Agile, which delivers on projects incrementally. And so now we are just really trying to look at how do we deliver value? You hear that term a lot, delivering value to the organization, to our stakeholders. And even here, when we think about our goals and things that we do for the year, we have to look at us as project managers too. And, and what is the value that we are um, bringing to the organization? So for others on the call, if anyone would like to come off and you know just say, you know, when you think about this time frame of, you know, 1969 to 2020, any thoughts that you have about project management and how it has evolved, you know, over this time? Anything that you would like to share? And I realize many of us may not have been here in, in 1969, but even if you were, you probably weren't involved in, in project management. But um, but, but needless to say, it has definitely um, changed over time. And we're up to the seventh edition of the Pinball Guide. And if you don't have the Pinball Guide, I would recommend that you get it because it will be um, a good study guide for you to have. It, it really lays out the, founda the foundation of you know, project management from PMI's point of view. And it's a reinforcement for this material that you're learning in this class and as you go through other um, subsequent classes, you'll be able to use that to help reinforce what you're learning. And as a member of PMI, you have access to this, um, to this guide and you can download it. Okay. Now the next slide gets into talking about the various project management life cycles and the development approach. So when you think about the first half of the slide, that's really more of, I think about like the waterfall type of projects so, you know, you have your plan, and so many of you have been involved in some of those projects. Maybe you would start off with your business requirements, we had to get those done, then we walked, went over to the design, and we had to wait till that was done, then we started doing development. And so, but think about sometimes, and maybe you have been on a project like this, maybe you got all the way to the end, it could have been a year, year and a half, maybe longer, and you didn't deliver any um, value to the business until you got to the end. And you had a sponsor, so usually that person, so think about this too in PMI's point of view, that sponsor is the person you know, who authorizes the project, you know, they're paying for it. Um, we have a team that's led by the project manager, so that would be us. And then we have different deliverables that we are bringing to fruition throughout that life cycle of that project and then we try to show if we can some kind of value along the way, but most, but oftentimes we don't have that delivery until you know the very end. And then we have the change based approach. So think about agile, right? Agile does incremental delivery. So in the organization I'm in, we have releases every couple of weeks. So if I'm working on an agile based project, then I can be able to show my my clients, you know, here's what we've delivered so you can see some of the functionality. So in this, when we talk about the key roles, so on the top we have project sponsor and we have the team, right, led by the project manager. In Agile, we have the product owner, 
when that person owns the value proposition. So what is it that we are trying to do, you know, for the business? We have a project team and there are a number of roles that make up that project team. And when you think about Agile, it's really based on self-managing teams. So it's not really somebody sitting around tell you, telling you what to do or waiting for somebody to set up a call. Teams just usually dive right in. And so the whole premise with Agile is, you know, learn fast, fail fast, you can change things, you're doing this incremental type of delivery when you're working in an agile space versus if you're in like a waterfall type of environment. And or you can have a combination. So many of you may have worked on projects where some teams are using waterfall based um, approaches where other teams are using agile. So any questions on the different types? Okay. And if you think of something later that you wish you had asked me, we can always um, go back. Okay. Excuse me, I went the wrong way. I'm just going to try to put this in slideshow mode to see if it would be better. Okay. Hopefully that's better. I should have done that initially to make it easier so it's a full screen. Now we get into the project management office or the, the PMO for short. So we have many large and established product organizations have a PMO. A PMOs are not a requirement for project management practice. So think about um, a large organization like ours, or there may be other companies that you have worked for who have also had PMOs. And typically they do support some of the larger initiatives. So they're putting place to be able to help you to make sure that if there's any methodology or standards that you need to be aware of, are there any special templates that you have to use? They can help do coaching and mentoring people, um, you know, helping like the project managers as a whole. Sometimes with PMOs too, when it talks about controlling, so monitoring compliance with the project. So if any of you have dealt with PMOs, you may find that they're asking you for status, or you have to give them, you know, updates on how you're doing with, with your project. If there's things that you need to know, they're there to provide kind of like their overall guidance to help you to help that project to be successful. And that PMO is not typically assigned to one project, or it can be, it just depends upon the project. They may cover multiple projects and they're there as their resource to help teams talks about being a directive and helping to manage those shared resources. So most of the time um, in our world, our resources are not totally dedicated to like one single project. Now, you may find situations where there are, it just depends on what that project is, but most of the time they are shared resources and they are working across more than one project. So that PMO can be able to help you know, to manage those resources to help, you know, those teams get what they need. Now, on the other side, this Agile Centers of Excellence, which we do have an Agile Center of Excellence here at at and and they do put out, you know, lots of information around process. They have their own training and different things that um, that's specific to that, that organization. And even with PMN, we also have um, Agile-based training as well and help students who want to get that type of certification. So, but for what you all are going for is your project management certification. And so with the center of excellence, so you can see some things that are a little bit like same. So look at that first bullet, coach team. So you also see that under the PMO side, you know, coaching under supportive piece. But for the Agile Center of Excellence, what they're trying to do is get us to use that Agile mindset, thinking about what skills do we need to be um, more agile thinking and what we do, how we deliver our products and services, trying to get that spread across the organization, not just in a silo. And then also making sure that we have um, sponsors too and like our product owners so that they are, are a part of this as well. There, there have been times that I've watched this over the years where we would have a situation where the business people were separate from the, you know, IT or tech, tech dev people. So now you find more of a mix or bringing, you know, everyone together. And that truly is more of an agile mindset. Any questions on, on this slide? Okay. 
And now we get into Melissa, was there, OPM. Yes. Sorry. Um, if you go back, there uh -huh. was a that orange icon there on the left side. Okay. Let me try to get it to go back up. I think there's a definition there that pops up when you click on that. Oh, this one. I. Oh, sorry. Um, it's that little orange, uh, like book icon towards the the bottom of the left screen there. When you click on it, it'll pop up a definition. Um, you have to be in. Okay, let me go back up. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I don't know why it's freezing up on me like that now. Mm. I was moving on to the next slide. Yeah. yeah, let me. I'm trying. I'm trying to get it to go back. That is. Um, let, let me get it out of slideshow mode and just go back to the slide, and then I'll put it back into slideshow mode from here. And hopefully, it'll be at the at the spot. <laughs> Keeps trying to move back. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, isn't this, isn't this fun? Okay. Maybe what you could do I, I is think, if you just scroll to the left from this yeah, view. Right here. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, here yep. we go. I think th this, this is what Zach is talking about right here. So when you see things like this, you really want to make a note of it. So thank you, Zach, for pointing that out. So this is the official definition from PMI, a management structure that standardizes the project-related governance processes and facilitates the sharing of resources, methodologies, tools, and techniques. PMOs are more common in larger organizations because of the number of projects that can be in process at the same time. So you want to be able to dial that in. And um, if you are creating some little flashcards of, or have part of your, your study guides, that would be something that you would want to remember. Okay. So now we get into OPM, so a system for value delivery. And with this definition on this one is strategy execution framework that coordinates project program, portfolio and operations management, and which enables organizations to deliver strategy. So when, when you think about um, when, when you when you think about this and then has it broken down into you see external environment. So those are things outside of our business that could affect affect us, right? Or affect our project. That could be regulatory, you know, government, local types of things that are, you know, outside of our control, but things we would have to take into consideration. We have our internal environments. So you may be working on a certain project, but we have to keep in mind cybersecurity, right? Because that's really important for us and understanding what are some of those internal environments, the type of things that we need to take into consideration. And then when it gets into the system for value delivery, so it's just giving you a breakdown of if you had a portfolio, and then within that portfolio, you can break down into programs and then also further down into projects. So when I was telling you that I work in CTX and the whole space around att.com and digital. I don't know if anyone on this call is working in the, the CTX organization, but even within your own, you may find that you have a portfolio of projects and maybe that portfolio is supporting a client or multiple clients, and then that portfolio will break down into programs. So I don't know if any of you have heard of BSSE. So that's like a billing strategy program where we're trying to really change our billing systems and some of the ordering systems that we use and they created a whole program for that area and then within that program it breaks down into projects and so then when you think about operations we have you know operations that we have to take into consideration you know at a corporate level so we have finance we have like our compliance that we have to, I know we used to call it Cato, but now it's just um, accessibility and making sure that we take that into consideration when we look at um, all of our projects. And then I don't think this slide had any um, any specific definitions other than the ones that, that you see up here at the top. So you just wanna understand, you know, what are, what are some of, um, you know, the, the differences when you think about portfolio, program, and then project. And obviously, if you're not working on, you know, something that, that's larger, you may not even be involved with, with an overall program. You may only be involved in projects. But just to be able to understand that there are differences and then to understand the factors that would impact it. Questions? Okay. 
All right, so then let me move on. Now we get into projects, programs, and portfolios. So just a little bit more detail on what I was just explaining about the other one. So we think about a portfolio. So again, that's you know, a collection of your know, overall projects, programs, and it could be to support a specific group, but it may be an objective. I know fiber is big for AT&T, so we have a whole program around fiber. And there's teams that have been put in place, you know, to manage that. And so when we think about that portfolio and then what are some of our business strategies, and depending upon what business unit that you're in, you know, you, those leaders from those business units will tell you, you know, what are the business strategies? What are some of the things that we are trying to achieve as they roll up, you know, to the corporate level at, at the very top and then filter their way down to us? So we go down to the portfolio management and then we have program management. So they have a bunch of um, projects that roll up into a program. And those projects could all be focused on just moving that program for, as so I mentioned, fiber, you know, a, as an option. And so there could be a lot of moving parts there. And that's why they want to have a program manager over it so we can keep everything in sync. Because oftentimes you'll have a lot of dependencies. And, and in order for us to be, be successful and make sure we are delivering value to, to the business, we want to make sure we're managing all of that. So that's why those larger initiatives will have that program um, management piece. And then you get down to project management. So down to the level that we are, and now we are managing that project and just trying to maybe there's a piece of that program that we are managing as part of our project, but it rolls up into a bigger um, funnel. So it's just always good to understand that and to know that if you are managing projects, you know, is that rolling up into a program? How does, how does that all play in just understanding, like, what are the differences in all these components as you look at each one? We did get a question in chat around that. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Did you want to? Okay. I can Actually, read it. Say portfolio management is like AT&T's most strategic platform. The BSSC would be the program. Moving over fiber is, is the project. So, so here, here's the thing. So with, with BSSC, and I, I will try not to get too derailed into some of the, the AT&T piece, but, but BSSC is a program that has a bunch of projects underneath it. There is actually a fiber program as well. I work on, on the fiber program, and there are projects that roll up underneath there. And so to be able to deliver that piece. So when, so when you think about, you could still have the program at the higher level, but then you have these individual projects that will be able to help deliver what that program is going to need to do. Sarah, did that um, address your question? Sort of, I think I'm following. So like you're saying fiber would be just another type of program, kind of maybe like even a sub program and moving fiber over into BSSE would even fall under both of those umbrellas? Well, it so it could, when you think about build, like how we bill fiber, like, I mean, billing is like the amount of money we send to the customer to pay, you know, for fiber. Yes. So they have to use those billing systems, yes. But, it, but we also have in terms of fiber, when I say as a program, it's like there's new products that we are delivering with fiber. So new plans that we offer our customers. So in terms of the speeds that they can get, and then those speeds have a certain cost. So we actually just rolled something out on April 30th, some new plans. But again, so that whole fiber program in terms of the products and the services that we are delivering under the fiber program. But then when you get into the billing aspect of it, right. that can moving fiber fall under to real-time biller would be that project. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that, but that's just, you know, one, one of the many projects. I mean, there's like hundreds of right. projects on the BSSC. I, uh, I'm just trying to create a picture that time. I can relate to. So. Yes. <laughs> sure. Yes. No, to totally understand. And if that helps you like to, you know, have those examples, then good. Because I want to make sure that, you know, the concepts and stuff, you can, you know, apply them. But if you find, like I was saying at the beginning, if something doesn't make sense, when, when you think about it and how PMI phrased it versus how we did it in at and for the test, just do PMI's way. Right. Okay. Don't let it be a sticking <laughs> point. Got it. Yeah. Yes. So now we're going to get into some of the, the organizational structures um, as, as it relates to project management. So we have functional, matrix, project-oriented, and composite, right? 
So now th these are all different types, and they're going to be on the next slide. There's going to be a char chart that breaks down each one. But some of the things we want to think about when you think about your organization, organizational structure and the governance. So we talk about um, the organizational groups and individuals, how do they interrelate with each other? How much authority does a project manager have? What resources are going to be available? And how will that project be conducted? So on this next slide, we're going to break each one of those down. And then I'm going to get some feedback from some of you in terms of which ones maybe that you have been a part of. So when we think about functionals in the first column, then we have matrix and then we have project oriented. Then we have those, the different roles. So the first one, team or um, components, team member loyalty. So when you think about functional, as you read it across, functional department, um, matrix is conflicted loyalty, and then project oriented is project. So what it's trying to tell you is in terms of team member um, loyalty, right? So if you're a functional and you're working on a project, and many of the AT&T projects fall under functional because we don't report to the project manager. I, ha I have not been on a project in my entire AT&T career where I actually reported to a project manager. I always had a functional manager that I report to. So my loyalty, my team member loyalty, when I'm thinking about functional, I'm always thinking about the department that I'm in. Um, and because that's really where I'm aligned to. Under matrix, it's going to be conflicted because you're going to have both in, in a matrix type type of, you know, a setting. And then with project oriented, that person is totally dedicated and assigned to the project. They're not working on anything else. Many of the things under the PMI um, view, they think about project manager and you having like control of your project. Not in a sense we do with AT&T where we may report to an AD or a director or someone else and we have to go to to ask for permission to do certain kinds of things. In PMI's world, as the lead project manager, you're managing the project, you don't have to do that. So next thing we talk about team member reporting. So again, I said they, they report to that functional manager. Could be that associate director, that director, um, or you know somebody else that that they may be in that their chain of command. For matrix, it's both functional and the, the project manager. So which leads to the above one with conflicted loyalty because if you're reporting to more than one person, it's kind of like, well, okay, so am I reporting to both people? What if they tell me different things? So you know you would have to deal with that. In project oriented um, world, you just report to the project manager. And those people actually report to the project manager. So they don't have a um, a functional manager. And then on a project manager role, it says here in functional that is seldom, you know, identified, but that you may, depend upon the department and the business unit, you know, they may or may not have project managers or those project managers may come from some other place. I mean, in the matrix world, you can be anybody from like their project coordinator, project, project admin up to a full project manager, and then under project oriented, that's a full-time um, person. That is their role, that is their job. They have a team that works for them. For your team members, again, we kind of talked about this a little bit, part-time, if you're in functional, part-time um, under matrix, full-time if you're on a project oriented. And I don't know, has anyone on the call ever been part of a project oriented, it does have to be at at and but any place where you've worked where you were under um, project oriented? Well, it's like there's nothing that I've seen here at at and And then the last piece talks about control over the project members. So if you're in functional, you're reporting to your boss. If, if there's any issues or concerns, that's the person that you are going to. Um, under matrix is kind of shared between your functional manager and whoever is the sponsor is for the project. And then under the project oriented, that again, is usually with the project manager. So those, those are the differences in, in the other types. I don't know Zach, if there's anything you want to add on this piece as well, or if, or if you've had any other um, experience with some of these, like a project oriented or one over the other. Um, I'm thinking we probably mostly see that matrix style, right? Where um, folks are 
you know, they might be in different functional areas or they might be a cross functional team that are supporting it. And there's that, you know, dotted line between the project manager leading it and, and the, the sponsor, which is, you know, probably a stakeholder of, you know, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, for project oriented, uh, I was thinking to myself, I'm wondering if this might represent like when we um, uh, leverage contractors. Um, that might not be the best example, so though. Been, yeah, and so see, so here for this one, the, the P, what I want you all to take away from this is it's really about the authority, right? So that authority that you're going to have on these different types of um, between functional matrix and project oriented, that's really what it's talking about, really the authority that you're going to have. And so project oriented is going to give you the most because you are working directly on all those team members and everybody. They're full time on the project. They're working for their project manager. When you get into the other two, the authority piece is going to be different. So I just want to make sure that I, that that's, that's what I want you to really take away from this is when you're thinking about or if you have questions on the exam, if it talks about the different types, it just wants to make sure that you understand it. So if someone, so if you had a question that was asking you like which of these types of organizational structures does the project manager have the most authority, then what, what would you all say? Project-oriented. Project -oriented. Correct, project-oriented. Yep. Good job. Okay, yeah, okay. All right, good. So this one, I, I don't, just for the, the essence of, of time, because we've talked about, you know, some of these things, it was, it was um, a thing where they say you could break into little groups and you can talk about that, but we can actually talk about this um, together, because in which is just a lead into back what we were just discussing. So the various different types, how do they work together? What experiences um, have you had? So I think for us here at at and we're more into that functional and as Zach was saying in some cases, that, that matrix type of structure um, for what we do here. But you just want to be able to understand, you know, the, the differences and then you know, the resources that, that come along with that as well. Okay, any other questions about any of the types? This might be jumping the gun, but when are each one of those most beneficial? Like, is there a particular project type or, um, I mean, obviously, at, at a behemoth like AT&T, it's not like one of us could say, gosh, this would be really great if I could have this project style, project oriented style, but you know, when, I guess, what risks are there and, and when would you want to use them? So it, it's really based on the organization in terms of how are they structured? So in our case, we fall more into this functional and in some cases, th this matrix. We don't really have project at least not in time, and I've been here a long time, that I've seen where as a project manager, other than what Zach was saying, like contractors, you'll have contractors report to project managers, but typically you don't have um, the rest of the project team reporting to the project manager. And so Sarah, if we were going to say, which of these would work best, if we could do it, project oriented would, would be a really good way. And as a project manager, it would give you more authority. Because if you're managing a project right now and it's under functional or matrix, you can't really do anything. You know, you may have a resource that some, if somebody's not working out right or you don't have the ability to hire and fire those people. I mean, obviously, if it's a contractor, you know, we can move contractors around. But if it's an employee, you would have to go to that, to their supervising manager. So you couldn't make that decision to be able to say, um, no, we, you know, we, we can no longer have this person here. But in project oriented, you would be able to do that because you have the ultimate responsibility over that project team versus any other two. You have to go to their, whoever their, their manager is and work with that person. And a lot of times if we want to do something, even it could be something around budget, there may be something that you want to do, you need more money. I think everybody here, if you've been on a project, you know how hard it is to get money and get things approved. You just can't do it as a project manager. You have to go through sometimes several la layers of um, leaders in order to get something approved to get money even added to your project. So those are some of the, the big differences that, that you'll see with the different types of structure. 
I, this is Tamara. I was going to ask that question, uh, not not that you have mm -hmm. to go back, but we see that a little bit, um, I, I think, falls on too. So Paul and I work a lot on the FirstNet program. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're obviously we're, we're project managers for that, but we get pulled into a lot. So there's dual, sometimes there's dual roles underneath mobility where mobility is really mm -hmm. driving the project, but we weigh in because you got to watch some things contractually the other way. So in that case, that feels to me a little bit matrix and maybe you can tell me it's not. Um, but that's where like you're a project manager, you're working under underneath or in a peer situation with another project manager, but they're really running it because they have the funding and the opportunity, right? But it's going to impact what you're doing as well. So I don't know if I'm reading that right, but that's how I equate it in a matrix situation where you kind of are not really the project manager leading the whole effort, but you definitely have a way in part for the responsibility that you have in your area. You, you do, and, and you are working together. And so when you look at some, just some of the, the differences mm -hmm. here, um, again, when you think about the authority, right? So if you are that other project manager, like how much authority do, do you have? And so if you are both, you know, working together, then yes, that could feel more like a, a matrix type of a, a situation okay. versus, you know, the, this project manager type. It's usually for me, for us, depends on who's bringing the money to the table, right, to work the project. <laughs> so, I mean, back to your money point. So, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Next thing gets into it is the, the project management principles. So, these are things that you would want to, I mean, you don't always have to, some things I would say you don't have to always memorize them, but it's good to know these. And so, as you think about them in terms of, and how do they, you know, make sense to you and, and play play into the, um, you know, with your project. So there's how many of them here, like just maybe like a, a dozen of them or so. So this is for all project pra practitioners, things you want to keep in mind. So obviously being diligent, respectful, and a caring steward, right? So we are servant leaders as, you know, as project managers and with the team. Um, recognize and evaluate and respond to system interactions. Navigate complexity. So you think about the project, you may be on something as simple, something that may be complex, and you know how, how do you move throughout that? Um, you want to be able to have a collaborative project team environment. Make sure everyone feels like they are a part of what you're doing. We have our leadership um, behaviors, and leadership may mean different things, you know, to different people. Um, we want to think about optimize our risk responses. Every project team you should be going through doing risk assessments, and you're actually going to have additional training that's going to get into some more of these things in, in more detail, like, you know, talking about risk. Um, how do we engage our stakeholders? Um, tailoring based on the context of what we're trying to do. Embracing adapt adaptability and resiliency. Focus on value. We kind of hear that a lot, this whole thing about value. And, you know, are we delivering value to the business? You want to make sure if you're working on something, it truly is, you know, worthwhile. I'm building quality into processes and deliverables and then enable change to achieve the envisioned future state. The one thing that you can always count on is what? Change, right? So so that so again you'll you'll have more um learnings of, about that as well. So when we think about all these things that we're trying to keep in mind and how we run our projects, how we run our teams, you know, expectations that we would have of our teams of our stakeholders and everyone that's involved in our project. These were just some of the, the principles. But again, PMI, you know, is not saying you have to memorize, you know, every single one of these, but and they're not in any, like, they're not in a priority order. So you're not going to get a question that tells you to name all the, the project management principles. But the, these are things that you do want to understand and then how they would uh, um apply to your projects and making sure these are things that you do take into consideration. On our next slide here, we get into, um, so we go into performance domains. So all of those 12 principles that we had on the previous um, slide gets into how to guide our behavior. And so if we start at the top, right, we have our stakeholders, so that's everyone who is going to have some kind of say in this project and it's going to be impacted by their project. And you could have a wealth of stakeholders on your project. 
Don't think of it just as, oh, it's the VP on this project, you know, is, is a stakeholder. It could be anyone, if you're coming out with a new product or service, it's anyone who is going to be impacted by that um, um, product or that service. And then making sure that those stakeholders are there, they're engaged, that they are helping you to make sure that the benefits that, that you're trying to achieve and that everything, you know, is running smooth and they definitely want to be um, a huge part of what is going on. You have your, your project team. You definitely want buy-in from your team, right? Because they are there, they're engaged, they're trying to deliver this product or this service. And hopefully you have a high performing team. And again, remember we had talked about, I was saying like the, the team member skills, right? So everybody is that has a different level of knowledge depending on how long they have been, um, you know, with the company or as a, as a part of that team. And then, you know, as they learn and everyone grows. We talked about the development approach and the life cycle. So remember, we might be working in a waterfall type of space, or we may be doing agile or maybe some combination of both. But in the end, what we are trying to do is figure out what's going to be the best approach that we should take to deliver that product, that service, you know, for this project so that we are delivering that value, right? Planning, project management. You always have to have a plan, right? You always have to know what is it that you're going to do. So as we have sat down and we, we think about, okay, how are we gonna structure our project? Um, what, are we, what approach are we going to use? We gotta think about, are there time frames that we have to take into consideration? So we wanna have all this stuff is going to go into our plan. And then we, all, we always know we have best laid plans, right? You have Murphy's Law, so you have to make sure you're putting in, you know, some of your, you know, kind of do what ifs, and that's where the whole risk analysis thing comes in. But you want to make sure that as you think about your plan, that plan has to support what it is that you're trying to do. And then moving down, as we, I'm, I'm going around down to project work. So now we take that plan, we get into project work, how is this team going to perform, how are we going to communicate with our stakeholders, how are we going to manage the resources. Um, we may have to get involved with procurement. Um, as Zach mentioned, maybe there's contractors that are involved. You have employees. So all of these things may, may be a part of that team that um, we have to have that in alignment with their plan, and then we get into the delivery piece. Right? So we have our team, the team knows what they're going to do. We're going to now get into delivery, making sure that, yep, here's what we have our plan. We have the team. We know what we need to do. Here's what the requirements are. Everybody understands it. And then we're going to make sure that all our deliverables that we have um, are in alignment with that delivery. Then we get into measurement, right? We can't do anything without measuring it because otherwise we don't know if we were successful. So what are some of those metrics that we are going to use to be able to show that we are successful and that we are delivering what we said we were gonna deliver? We think about you know, how much money we said we were gonna spend, what was the time frame we said we were gonna deliver this in. So again, right across from measurement is the approach, right? So if we were doing this waterfall, we know that this project may take a year or two years versus if it's agile based, project may take six months, but over that six month time frame, we're gonna deliver it in increments. So we're gonna be able to show some functionality so that our sponsors can see, yep, here's what I can see that, here's the benefits that I would like this project to achieve and we they can see along the way how we're doing and then how we're measuring it. And then uncertainty, right? You don't know what you don't know. But one thing we can't always account on is there's going to be some kind of change. There may be some factors and things that we don't um, understand. Um, there is a term that's called PESTLE, P-E-S-T-L-E. If you hear that, it stands for political, economic, social, technological, legal, and environmental, right? So all those are external factors, external risk factors that could impact our project. So you would want to make sure that you are looking at that and taking those things into consideration. So remember how I mentioned, I had the nutrition label project, that was a government mandate. So I would have to think about what are some of the government um, regulations or rules and things that we have to follow. They gave us this mandate that says, we have to deliver this in this way so that our customers can be able to see 
If they buy one of our broadband plans or our mobility plans, they know what they're going to pay. They know what their fees are going to be. We have to lay all that out. And so, um, so those are things you just want to take into consideration. Any questions on any of, of the domains or the principles? Okay, then I will keep going. Okay, Agile. Um, so, could you repeat that acronym again? Yes, I'm oh, sorry. Pestle. The, the ac and yes, yes, yeah, P Pestle, P E S T L E, and I'll put it in in the chat too. Okay. And, but it stands for Political, Economic, Social, Technological, Legal, and Environmental. So those are Got things it. that, from a risk identification perspective, mm -hmm. those are some of the things you may want to look at depending upon your project, because they mm -hmm. could have an impact on your project. Thanks. I did, didn't get them all. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yep. You're welcome. Yep. And I will, I'll put it in the chat. Mm -hmm. We'll see that again later someone... in the second topic as well. Yep. Okay. So that's, right. that's coming up as well. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Okay. Yep. And then um, Agile. So many of you, if you are involved in, in Agile projects, and if you're not, that's fine. But these are some of the things you just want to get. Um, just think about there, there's an agile manifesto and that's on these next um, next slides. So the thing about agile and you can see on the left hand side of the screen versus the right hand side of the screen, some of the differences. Right. So when you think about value, so individuals and interaction. So in agile, that's more important than process and tools. So you all know we have plenty of process and tools in AT&T, right? Sometimes the process gets in the way and we're tripping over the process. But in the Agile world, and it's part of the Agile Manifesto for software development is called, um, they value individuals and interaction over process and tools. They, had, they value having a working software over comprehensive documentation. So if you're a person who's have been involved in a lot of waterfall projects and you know there's a lot of documentation that has to be done, and oftentimes you want to make sure like every I is dotted, every T is crossed, and it's very comprehensive. In the agile world, you may not find a lot of documentation. Their key is we focus on working software. Not that you can't have documentation, but when when you think about what's what's of more value having the working software versus the comprehensive documentation. Because you can have documentation and the software doesn't work. And so that, that's not going to help, you know, your, your stakeholders. Um, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. So we hear a lot about collaboration, such a, a big buzzword, and we hear it a lot um, in, in our business in day to day. But making sure that customer, and we're customers too internally. You could be working on a project. But you may be a customer for that project. It's not always just our external customer that's buying our products and our service. We have internal customers too, and just want to make sure that we do have that collaboration over like negotiating contracts and then responding to change versus following a plan, right? So if something happens in Agile, it's like fail fast, change it, move on. Um, you know, waterfall, a lot of times you have a plan, it's not so easy to, to shift things around. So that's that's where you know you see the differences, and th this goes back to 2001. So this has been out for a very long time. And then on the next slide here, it just actually gives you all those principles that are behind that Agile manifesto. And there's actually a link um, to this, and we can post that um, in the chat as well, where where you can actually see all of these principles. So they they really do tie back in, into the previous slide. So like number one. Highest priority, satisfy the customer, early and continuous delivery of valuable software. So again, you know, fail fast, you know, deliver often. If it's wrong, fix it, try something else, keep on moving, right? If you need to change your requirements, in Agile world, you can change your requirements. It's, it's not the same a lot of times when you're looking at, you know, waterfall approach. So these are just some of the things that, that you get into about, you know, agile and how agile in that thinking, in that mentality of that the agile space. And so if you haven't worked on any agile projects, hopefully you you will get a chance to do that. And then you'll be able to see the differences in terms of, oh, I worked on waterfall, now I've worked on agile, and then you can be able to see what, what the differences are, you know, in the two. Any questions on, on any of these? I, I don't want to read read all these to you. I know you all can read, but just I just wanted to point out, you know, the couple couple of them because 
you know, in terms of how, what, how Agile looked at things. And then the next slide just gets into the other one. So there are, there are 12 all together. And then again, um, we can give you the link to that website where you can um, find all of these. Has anyone here worked on, you can just raise your hand, just like a little raise your hand. Anybody work on Agile projects? We got a couple of people, three. Okay. So it looks like we have a few people that, that work on Agile. So that's, um, that's really like the wave of the future, you know, being able to, because you can deliver things a lot faster. I don't know if any of you have worked on a waterfall project where you got to the end and it wasn't quite what the client was expecting. And now you're trying to go back, fix a bunch of defects and, and, you know, do different things. And now you don't have, you know, a happy client because they client because they waited for a whole year and then they didn't get really what they wanted versus agile that would happen to you because you would have a chance along the way to fix some things. So that's one of the biggest differences. Um, Oh, doing agile versus being agile, right? Agile means iterations are likely to be shorter. So remember I said in the organization I'm in, we release every two weeks. I know there are some teams who do three weeks and then we continue to get that feedback and you continue to evolve and to change. So that's really one of the, the big things is um, when, when we think about how our mindset, you know, you hear people say, have a more agile mindset, be open to change. Um, we, you know, we have tools and processes and things, not saying that, that you won't have that, but just don't let the process be the one to just totally drive everything into real things. So in Agile, they just want you to be able to, you know, really think about, you know, being, being open, working with your team, you work with your customers, they're part of your team, they're not separate, you know, they're in there, they're in the mix with you. Okay. Here's another definition for you to remember, tailoring. Tailoring is the deliberate adaptation of the project management approach, governance, and processes to make them more suitable for the given environment and the work at hand. So we talk about, you know, projects being unique, right? You know, they have a start date, they have an end date. And so we just have to make sure that we are being adaptive to what it is that, that we're trying to deliver. So everything, don't think of it as all black and white, you know, cut stone. So constantly iterating, you know, continuously changing, making improvements, you know, working with your, your customers, collaborating with your team. Th those are a lot of the principles with Agile. I want to make sure that um, we get to my screen froze again. Oops, sorry, my friend, let me escape out of this. My screen froze again. I don't know why you're doing that. Let me try this again, different way. Okay, we, we talked about some of this already in terms of like um, Taylor hybrid approach, processes, practices, and methods. So when you think about um, what's, what's going to be the best approach for you to follow based on whatever project that, that you are or what you have to, you know, do. And so thinking about um, how often does it have to be delivered? So that's that delivery cadence. So two weeks, you know, three weeks, whatever, whatever that case may be, which approach are you going to use? And then you just want to make sure that um, you tailor your processes to that. So if it's a waterfall, you know, there's certain things you're going to do. If it's agile, there's, there's other things that you're going to do. And if it's hybrid, you know, you're, you're going to blend them. So it's just going to depend on that environment, your culture, like different factors and things you want to just take and keep into, um, you know, consideration. So let me stop and see any questions that you all have on any of the, the materials that we've covered so far. Okay, so then what I'm going to do now is shift it over to Zach. And Zach, I'm going to stop sharing, and then I will let you. Sh Does anyone? I know we have about since the class is only an hour and a half. I figure that we could just keep going. I know it's late, and some of you probably just would rather, I would think, just finish so you can get on with your evening and have dinner. Um, but Zach, if if you want to get into the next topic, the strategic alignment piece. Yeah, sure. I sure can. Okay. Um, we've got about uh, nine slides left, um, so. We'll work through that, and then we'll, we should be able to give you some time back. 
Uh, I don't want to commit to what <laughs> what I have left, but um, I should be able to get through these slides before we get to before we get to you know seven thirty. So. OK, all right, so uh, the next topic that we have for tonight is str strategic alignment, uh, and this is really important to make sure that as a project managers, we're understanding the bigger picture of broader organizational strategy and global trends. Uh, and it's really important because we know that, you know, in today's projects, they're more complex and it requires a broad set of skills and capabilities. So this is all about helping us make more effective decisions. So let's go to the next slide. And this here is presenting the PMI talent triangle, which is just a practical representation of critical professional skills. And it's become an important and well recognized icon for the PMI brand. So for example, once you become PMP certified, uh, in order to retain your certification, uh, you'll have to earn uh, PDUs or professional development units against each of these categories in order to retain your certification. So that's one of the things that, um, and as well as giving back, that's one of the things Melissa and I are able to get from giving back and, and conducting this course. We earn PDUs towards renewing our certification as well. So what I'll do is I'll walk through each of these. Um, and what what this does is this just helps from a project management perspective, you know, understand the changing world of work and embrace the smarter ways of working, right? So the first one we have is the ways of working. This is mastering diverse and creative ways to get any job done. So we're thinking about, you know, do we have the right resources at the right time, uh, things like that, and being creative around that to make sure that uh, we're performing work smarter and not necessarily harder, right? Uh, the next one here is power skills. These are those critical interpersonal skills required to apply influence, inspire, change, and build relationships. So this is really important as far as working with uh, your different team members, working with your different stakeholders, cross-functional teams, those types of things, right? All those relationships are really important and will help uh, lead to better project success for you. And then the last one here is business acumen. This is uh, around making effective decision making and understanding how projects align with, again, the bigger picture of the broader organization and the strategies and those global trends, right? So this is just really understanding the strategic business management and, and how your business operates and the project that you are running, right? Uh, a little note here is that the business acumen side of the talent of the talent triangle is um, considered to be less emphasized in the other areas of the of the talent triangle on the PMP certification exam, but um, it is arguably one of the most crucial to understanding for project professionals, right? Because if you don't understand how your business operates, you may not understand how your project fits into the business, right? So just just throwing that out there that you may see more questions around these other two, the ways of working and power skills and less with the business acumen, um, but do understand that it, it's a leg of the triangle, right? So it doesn't work unless you have all three together. Okay, next we've got strategic alignment and business management skills. So just some questions here off to the side as I read a few things, right? Um, for example, do you know your organization's strategic plan? So what is a strategic plan? So this is where we have our definition. A strategic plan is a high level business document that explains an organization's vision and mission, plus the approach that will be adopted to achieve this mission and vision, including the specific goals and objectives to be achieved during the period covered by the document. So strategic alignment has to do with knowing how a project lines up with the interests of the business, both internally and externally. Uh, sometimes this is also referred to as, um, if you're thinking about it from strategic and business management, those skills are often referred to as domain knowledge, and it involves the ability to see the high level view of an organization, the industry and the products. Um, it does require working knowledge of business functions as well as key products and preferably previous experience in the industry. So this is where you're seeing these questions that are listed here on the slide. Regardless of past work, a project manager really should be able to understand and explain 
the essential aspects of the project as they relate to the business, right? So thinking of that business acumen that I mentioned on the previous slide. And then some of the questions here at the bottom, the can you questions, right? Working with business stakeholders, SMEs and the sponsor, uh, it's important to work toward understanding the capabilities and capacity of the organization. And that's to incorporate the results delivered by the project and then develop the appropriate delivery strategy to support the, uh, the realization of those benefits. And then project managers must determine the strategy for both the development and the, the delivery of the project results in order to maximize that business value of the result, right? So there's two aspects there, understanding uh, what the appropriate strategy is, and then how are you maximizing the business value to the, to the business? Okay, I'm gonna move to the next slide. So here we've got this uh, nice little triangle from PMI standard for portfolio management. So there's a, a little little uh, little diagram here from that. Um, but what this is just representing is it's representing um, you know the different areas of strategic management, right? Starting at the top, we have our vision. This is where the business wants to go. This is the aspirational, uh, you know, what are we doing for this year or. Uh, you know, what are we doing for the next three years? You know, those types of things. Um, your mission, that's that pre-established objective or purpose. So the mission helps us achieve our vision. And then as we go down, we also have objectives. So these are the defined areas of pursuance, right? What are we looking to go do? What are, what are we looking to, um, you know, what's our metric that we're trying to reduce cost by, for example, or what's our metric that we want to reduce some sort of manual thing for something more automated, right? Before I go into these next ones, I'll talk about the the, op, the wording here on the slide off to the right side there. So some agile projects will use a goal setting framework such as objectives and key results or OKRs. And uh, that is just describing the organization's objectives and, and, their, and their results. So you may hear, hear that term as well um, for agile projects and how they define what their objectives are going to be. Some other things that might be defined through strategic management is, you know, what are our goals? So that could be our milestones, resources. It could talk about our strategies, right? How are we, um, what resources are being used to accomplish our purpose? Um, it could include just various projects and uh, programs and the projects that run under that, um, operating procedures or standard operating procedures. It could also reference organizational structures. So really all of these are um, used to identify the strategy that can be implemented by the combined portfolio of programs and projects, as well as the ongoing operations. So this is more of what you're seeing there towards the bottom of, of the triangle here around the portfolio management, the operational procedures, otherwise known as uh, organizational process assets or OPAs. We'll talk about that further in just a second. Um, those are all things that are used to carry out the strategic elements. And then you have at the bottom there, the organizational resources. This is the support and the work towards establishing the most appropriate organizational structure to achieve those goals, right? So based on your organization, um, are we, uh, is it a, is how is the organization structured in order to support uh, this triangle, right? How are we working up back through the triangle to support our strategy as well as our all of our portfolio and our programs and our projects that will help us achieve our objectives to meet our mission to ultimately achieve the mission, uh, sorry, vision, right? Okay. So let's, I mentioned OPAs, but let's talk a little bit further about organizational influences. So projects operate in environments that may influence them, that could be favorably or unfavorably. And there really are two major categories that influence the way a project is performed. And then they need to be considered as the project is started. So these two areas are the enterprise envir environmental factors or EEFs. These can be external or internal to the organization. So I can click on this little slot, this definition here that says those e the EEFs are conditions outside the immediate control of the team 
they can influence, constrain, or direct the project program or portfolio. And then the other uh, one that we have here is the organizational process asset. So these are project policies, procedures, templates. It could be historical project information. And then for our internal OPAs, this refers to all the implicit input or assets uh, on processes used by an organization and operating a business. So it can include, but not limited to, business plans, processes, policies, protocols, and then knowledge. So we think about how does the organization operate uh, and what does it use in order to um, maintain its operating model, right? Those are all things that support the OPAs. Uh, we will see another slide that will give you some examples. So uh, I'll show that in a little bit. So you'll see the difference between what we would consider an E, uh, the enterprise intervi <laughs> I'm trying to say the acronym and I can't say that either, but uh, we're, we'll show you the example between EEFs and OPAs here in just a minute. All right, and I mentioned that you would see this again when we talked about uh, PESTLE earlier. So it's important to get to know the external business environment, right? Uh, it's important to understand, again, how your project is operating in the business environment that you're in. And so some ways that you can try to um, better understand some uncertainty or risks or just external factors that, that could uh, influence your project, maybe even some opportunities. There's a couple of approaches that you can take to help you guide, um, right? So uh, these practices here, um, Pestle, TCOP, and VUCA are, can be used during brainstorming and discussion sessions to help uh, teams work through, you know, if we're using Pestle, for example, right, what would be our uh, political, uh, you know, what, what items would we put here that could influence our project from a political perspective? And this may not necessarily be, uh, you know, if we think about this may not necessarily be like governmental politics, right? It could be office politics, right? What could be some ways that um, there's a certain uh, political method in the organization that we need to adhere to, right? So PESTLE is that political, economic, sociocultural, sociocultural techni technical, legal, and environmental. TCOP is technical, environmental, commercial, and operational with political there at the end. And then VUCA is often used with more complex, um, uncertain, ambiguous pro uh, projects. Uh, this is often a, a brainstorming technique used um, in the military and government agencies, right? But it's around, you know, what's our volatility? What's the uncertainty, complexity, the ambiguity? And this helps those projects that tend to be high uncertainty or high complexity, better address those areas that are influencing that project that could derail it because it is because it's either so ambiguous or so complex or so uncertain. And then here at the bottom, there are some other items that you can do to just compare and better understand your business environment. Uh, one of those is comparative advantage analysis. We got feasibility studies, right? Is it feasible for us to pursue something? Um, we have SWOT, which is strength, you know, what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. We've got assumption analysis, right? Um, it's easy to make assumptions about things. Uh, are our assumptions always correct? Uh, historical information analysis, and then we also have risk alignment with organizational strategy. Okay, next we have internal business environmental factors, right? So does your organization have a clear strategic vision, right? Or are there any major changes, right? It's important to understand um, and be aware of what's happening within the internal business space, right? Because any of these organizational changes could have a dramatic impact on the scope of a project of your project, right? Um, you could lose funding, for example, or you know, a leadership change could result in the loss of funding as they want to change priorities. Uh, for those of us that have been around for a while, I'm sure we know that that happens. Um, you know, a different leader might want to do a different thing, right? Um, so it's important that as a project manager, uh, you have visibility into 
business plans, reorganizations, process changes, uh, and other internal activities. So these are those internal enterprise environmental factors. And then uh, here towards the bottom, internal business changes might require a project to respond with changes before or during the project effort, right? So uh, this could happen you know, throughout the life of your project or before it gets started. So it's important to, as a project manager, be aware of something that might change how your project is impacted before you get started. That might have different activity for you to do than if you're in the middle of a project, right? So for example, uh, it might be easier at the beginning of the project to shift your strategy if you need to deliver new deliverables versus if you're in the middle of delivering de deliverables and then you need to pause something and, and shift focus to somewhere else, right? So that's the second bullet that we've got there, reprioritization of value. Okay, and then next, I promised I'd give you some examples. So this is what this slide has. Again, for our uh, OPAs or our organizational process assets, uh, these are two main categories. We've got the processes, policies, and procedures. So the examples here are organizational charts, procurement rules, hiring. Uh, the other category is the organizational knowledge bases. So think of wikis, libraries, archives, lesson learned repositories, anywhere where we're capturing information. Um, and that's being used to help in, inform others about certain certain topics or products or services, for example. And then uh, off to the right there, we have our enterprise and environmental factors. Again, these can both be internal and external. So if it's internal, this is our resource capabilities, right? Uh, what skills do, do team members have? Uh, what are their competencies, for example? Organizational structure. We have IT software, right? So are we are we limited or constrained by a certain type of software that we're using, or do we have an opportunity because of a type of software we're using? And then distribution of facilities, right? Where are where are where is the team located? Uh, you know, where are our hubs, for example? If we think about AT and T, um, that could impact uh, how projects uh, are influenced based on you know where we're distributed. And then for those external factors, these are things outside of the project. Uh, marketplace conditions, right? Um, you know, based on the product or service that we're trying to bring to market, right? Uh, what are our competitors doing, for example? What does it look like for us? You know, what's the forecast there? Uh, laws, regulations, and standards that could impact um, how we do project work, but it's not necessarily um, you know, dictated by the business or the organization we're in. We have regulations and standards that we have to meet, for example. Um, operating conditions, this could be just, um, uh, this could be a variety of things, right? Um, you know, is there a certain time frame that work needs to be done? Um, is the work where the work is being done, is it, um, you know, do we have civil unrest, for example, if we're working on an international project or, you know, just here at home, do we, is there a situation going on? Things like that. Um, it could also be uh, environmental impacts, right? You know, uh, is there a natural disaster declared or, you know, is it an area that might be getting, might be in the path of a, you know, a hurricane that's coming, right? Those types of things. How we would, how would we respond to that? And then you've got the social and cultural influences as well, right? So what are some uh, what are some uh, cultural influences that might impact the project based on the product or service that we're selling? You know, um, we might want to think about, you know, before we bring something to market, you know, maybe it has uh, a name that doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> um, you know, maybe we're calling our product uh, Sane, for example, and uh, it's it would be easy for you know a competitor to say oh it doesn't work and you know it's insane that they tried to you know sell that product or something like that right so that's just something to think about as far as how we you know what what damage to the brand could happen based on you know social and cultural uh, influences there okay and then the last slide that we have here is this is just an activity here so um this should, shouldn't take too much time, so I think I'll open this up to the class, but here is a list of uh, EEFs and OPAs. 
And just curious, um, based on these six here, A through F, if we think we can cap, if we think we can identify which is which. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Don't be shy. Probably. Try the first one. <laughs> I probably should also mention that this this project name is for Shopee Lifestyle Center. Um, so that should help you think about what kind of project this is based on what the list is here. So go ahead. What do you all think for the first one? EEF or OPF? -E 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep, good job, good job. So the economic demand for a new shopping area that we could consider that a marketplace condition, right? Anyone else want to try another one here? Can we identify the OPA? Yeah, the archive of uh, large infrastructure projects. Yep, good job. <clears throat> yep, so that would be uh, our, our, our library or knowledge base, right? Good job. Okay, and I know we're getting close to the end of time here. So um, actually the way that this is this list is presented to you, A through C are our enterprise and environmental factors, right? These are things that are happening uh, outside, they're external to the project, right? And then D, D, E, and F are our OPAs. So we've got the archive, we've got our approved vendor and contract lists that could be our organizational resources, right? And then the tenant selection process. How, as the lifestyle center, are we selecting tenants to be at that center, right? So that that one's that one I got to talk through a little bit, but um, that's those last three are the OPAs. The top three are the EEFs. Okay. All right. That's a wrap. You all got through it. You got to give yourself a a hand. You got through your part of your, your first lesson and on Wednesday, um, Zach will be leading you through the rest of um, this lesson. And Zach, if, if you want me to pinch it with you on Wednesday's class, just let me know. And um, okay. I can, um, can help you with that. And then I will be back so next Monday when we get into identifying and engaging our stakeholders. So in, in lesson two, hopefully you all have the schedule. You can see the breakdown of how the lessons are being taught and then who all of the instructors are. But if there's ever anything that I can do to help you as you go through this journey, please don't hesitate to reach out. I truly do love teaching these classes. It's, it's a lot of fun for me and it's a way to give back. And I can tell you that this is very worthwhile what you are doing, the certification, will support you no matter where you are, no matter what industry you're in. That's the cool thing about project management. You can use it at work. You can use it personally. I know I, I've done both, and it is the one certification that I truly do make sure that I keep up with, and I think you will find it of value. So just know that it won't be for naught, that you really are doing something worthwhile. So we just thank you for your time. Are there any other questions before we wrap up? I know some of you are probably ready for dinner. Yes. Yeah, uh, just one thing I wanted to comment on. Uh, make sure you're assigned to a mentor circle and take full advantage uh, of using that. Because the people who are doing the mentoring are uh, top notch. So. I also wanted to say thank you both Melissa and Zachary for an outstanding job tonight. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, it's thanks, been Eric. our pleasure, pleasure to do this. And as Harry said, sign up for the mentoring circles because then that can help you um, get more of that one-on-one -on -one time and do more practicing and studying and help really delve into even more detail than what we're able to go through in this a limited amount of time that we have with you. We just want to make sure that we are being respectful of your time, but want to give you the support that you need. So definitely sign up for Mentoring Circle. Get those flashcards going and study guides and just start building this information as you go throughout your training. And so as it leads up to you going and taking that exam and, and passing and becoming PMPs, 
So again, I hope you all have a wonderful evening and um, thank you. Hey, Melissa, anything else? I have a question. Yes. 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 This is Frida. Um, if we have questions about something that was covered tonight, how can we reach out to you? Like, can we get your email address? Oh, yes. It's mr1951 at att.com. You can send me an email. You can message me in Teams. And I will be more than happy to reply. Okay, you said it's M. I'm not on Teams. I'm no longer AT and T. Oh. oh, okay. So then you can just do Melissa dot Randall at att dot com. Okay, that's what I needed. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, uh, Frida, it's Harry again. Uh, Go ahead. Hi, Harry. Yeah, I contact an instructor or contact me directly if you have any questions too. Mine's okay. Dashwood at att.com. Okay, great. Because I sent you an email this evening. Perfect. I'll do that. Thank you. Great. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a good so, evening. Thank everybody. you all. Have a wonderful evening and best of luck as you continue with your studies. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Great session. Thank Bye. Thank Bye. You. Thanks, Thanks, guys. You're welcome.